Over the winter of 57 and 56 BCE, Caesar had a decision to make. He was almost halfway through his five-year term as the governor of Cisalpine Gaul, Transalpine Gaul, and Illyricum. If he had any post-governorship ambitions, he had to start making plans now. He could go back to the Senate and assume his place as a leader in the reform faction, but that wasn't nearly as exciting as being at the head of an army. Plus, throughout Caesar's life, we get hints that he didn't love the Senate. Remember, during his year as consul, he did everything in his power to cut the Senate out of the legislative process. He could run for consul again, but legally, there had to be a 10-year gap between consulships, and the Senate wasn't likely to grant an exemption in his case. That put his next eligibility at 49 BCE at the earliest. Caesar sent for his triumvirs, his not-so-secret political allies, Pompey and Crassus. The three men met in a town called Lucca in Cisalpine Gaul. This meeting, which is known to history as the Lucca Conference, has become the stuff of legend. Later, writers would claim that hundreds of senators accompanied Pompey and Crassus on this pilgrimage, but this is probably a later invention. When the three men met, Caesar had a proposal waiting for them. First, he wanted Pompey and Crassus to both run for consul. It was winter now, elections were usually held in the late summer, and if they were successful, they would assume office the following January. Second, once they were in office, Caesar wanted them to put forward legislation extending his term as governor. He was midway through a five-year term now, and he wanted another five years added on to that. At the end of ten years as governor, he would be eligible for another term as consul. Third, he wanted Pompey and Crassus to secure for themselves, with the support of Caesar's allies back in Rome, powerful governorships of their own. They agreed that Pompey would get both of the Spanish provinces, and Crassus would get the prestigious province of Syria. With all three triumvirs in charge of powerful provinces, they would each be able to focus on their own affairs and stay out of each other's hair. See, there were rumors circulating at the time that Crassus was secretly offering financial support to Clodius back in Rome. On paper, Clodius was an ally of Caesar's, but in reality, the man was out of control. Remember, Clodius had indirectly come into conflict with Pompey over the issue of Cicero's banishment. If this rumor was true and Crassus was financing this conflict, it means that the triumvirate was beginning to crumble. The three men agreed to this plan, and Pompey and Crassus returned home. The triumvirate wasn't just held together by political necessity, but also by a bunch of small personal connections. For instance, Crassus' son, Publius Crassus, was serving under Caesar in Gaul. Publius was probably in his late 20s, and too young for a command. But after the Conference of Lucca, Caesar began to ignore convention and unofficially put him in charge of a legion anyway. This was probably done as a favor to old man Crassus. For the coming year, Caesar sent the young Crassus and his one legion deep into northwestern Gaul to secure some tacit support from the tribes in the region with a non-violent show of force. He also sent another legion, under the command of a legate named Galba, to the Alps. By the way, this Galba's son's son's son would be a future Roman emperor. Galba's job was to set up permanent outposts, which would protect travelers from the Gauls living in the mountains. As it was now, traveling through the Alps was extremely dangerous, especially for traders. If Caesar was planning on being in Gaul for another seven plus years, he wanted to make it as easy as possible for goods to get in and out of Italy. While constructing one of these mountain outposts, Galba's legion was attacked by the native Gauls, and for a time they were completely surrounded. But Galba kept his cool and broke out in a surprise attack, which won him the day. With one legion busy establishing a safe route through the Alps, and another legion making peace with tribes in northwestern Gaul, Caesar in his commentaries says that Gaul was reduced to a state of tranquility. This marks a bit of a turning point in Rome's relationship with Gaul. Caesar was no longer simply reacting to events. He was behaving as if Rome was there to stay, permanently. But Gaul's tranquility couldn't last forever. 
In northwestern Gaul, the young Crassus had established diplomatic relations with many of the tribes in the region, and accepted hostages from them as a sign of good faith. The hostages weren't kept in cages or anything, they just lived with the Romans, and were used as collateral if anything weird happened. This was normal practice in the ancient world, especially when a powerful state bumped up against a weak one. Some of these hostages were from a tribe called the Veneti. The young Crassus later sent diplomats to the Veneti to negotiate the purchase of some grain. When they arrived, the Veneti arrested the diplomats and took them as hostages of their own. Who knows why they did this? They may have seen it as a fair exchange for the hostages taken by Rome. They may have been annoyed with the Romans for showing up and acting like they owned the place. It could have been a simple misunderstanding. Either way, I think it's pretty clear that this was a minor diplomatic incident. But when Caesar got word of this, he chose to interpret the act as a formal declaration of war and a full-blown Gallic uprising. He immediately ordered a fleet of ships built on a river that led to the Atlantic Ocean and mobilized his entire army. He sent a message to the young Crassus, telling him to move south and continue establishing contact with the tribes there. With that done, he ordered three fresh legions to northwestern Gaul to stop any neighboring tribes from aligning themselves with the Veneti. Then he instructed Labinus to go with one legion to the newly pacified Belgae territory, just in case they took this opportunity to try something. This left Caesar with three legions for himself. He told his river fleet to start moving toward the Atlantic Ocean whenever they were ready and marched off. He would deal with the Veneti personally. The Veneti specialized in sea trade, so when they heard that there was a bunch of angry Romans coming their way, their first instinct was to load everybody onto their giant sailing ships and get out of there. They watched from just offshore as Caesar came across their abandoned villages and systematically burned them to the ground. What the Veneti didn't expect was for a Roman fleet to appear seemingly out of nowhere. Roman ships were tiny things with oars, designed for going back and forth across the Mediterranean, while the Veneti ships were these monsters with giant sails, designed for long-distance travel in the Atlantic Ocean. The Roman ships attacked, but they quickly discovered that the Veneti ships were too sturdy to ram and too tall to board normally. But they were able to figure out that they could pull up alongside them and pull down the Veneti rigging with big hooks on poles, preventing them from sailing away. After that, it was only a matter of time before the Romans figured out how to climb onto the Veneti ships. Caesar's army watched from the shore as the Romans destroyed the Veneti fleet. The surviving Veneti surrendered to Caesar unconditionally. He had their entire ruling council put to death, and everybody else he sold into slavery. This was an unthinkably harsh punishment for something so small. This caused an uprising by some of the neighboring tribes, but these were put down by the three legions stationed nearby. Try to notice the subtle change that had taken place here. Caesar isn't positioning his legions as if he's a general marching through enemy territory. He's moved in. He's enforcing the peace. With only a short time left in the campaigning season, Caesar marched toward Belgae territory. There had been a small uprising there as well, which Labinus had successfully put down. The thing that still bothered Caesar was that there were two tribes around modern Calais that he said never formally made peace with him after he subdued the Belgae. In Caesar's mind, they were still at war. This is a pretty weak excuse to march all the way across Gaul. Even if it was true, these people did literally nothing to provoke him. When Caesar arrived, these villages were abandoned as well. They must have heard what happened to the Veneti. The Romans set up their camp in a forested area, and all of a sudden, without warning, they were attacked. The Roman infantry didn't even have time to assemble, and just got into random groups, and formed a line of defense as fast as they could. They took heavy losses, but they held and it's a small miracle that they weren't completely overrun. The Gauls fell back, and the Romans gave chase into the woods. Caesar notes that in the woods, his men suffered even heavier losses. This implies that the Romans may have been led into further ambushes, but Caesar glosses over this. 
In the days that followed, Caesar turned this temporary camp into a permanent one by clear-cutting the trees surrounding the camp for visibility and having additional walls built for defense. With Caesar finally satisfied that his boot was firmly on Gaul's neck, he turned his army around and marched south for the winter. He had big plans, but they wouldn't bear fruit until next year.